Hello, and welcome again to the Digital Economy uh, Lunch Seminar. Uh, I'm Eric Green Yolston, and today's uh, seminar speaker is Marshall Van Alstein, an old friend and colleague of mine. I won't say how many years or decades, but it was in the last century that we first met. Um, so Marshall's a Questron professor, or the Questron professor of uh, information economics at Boston University at, at the School of Business. He's a leading expert in network business models. He conducts research on information economics, covering such topics as communication networks, economics of networks, intellectual property, social effects of technology, and productivity effects of information, some of which we worked on together. Um, as a co-developer of the concept of two-sided networks, Marshall's been a major contributor to a new set of ideas that are now being taught worldwide. Uh, for the seminar, we welcome and encourage questions. Um, if you're in Zoom, the Zoom audience, please submit your questions during that using that Q&A function there in Zoom, not the chat function. And if you're here in the room at Stanford in person, just raise your hand and I'll call on you to ask questions. I may repeat the question for the Zoom audience, um, depending on how the audio works. So with that, uh, Marshall, welcome to Stanford. Please tell us about free speech platforms and the fake news problem. Fantastic, thanks, Eric. Um, it's a real honor to be here and I can't say you know, exactly how many gray hairs have been added since I've been working with Eric on a number of different important <laughs> topics. So, <laughs> no, I think the, the gray hairs are from kids. Uh, the research I think keeps me excited. So I'm hoping that things will actually um, be open. So what relative to misinformation these days. I almost don't think it matters what problem you care to work on, whether it's global warming, whether the uh, president who's in office is legitimate or not, whether it's vaccines, whether they work or not. If we can't agree on the basic facts, it's really hard to design policies to actually make interventions. What I really wanna do is to see if we can come up with different techniques for that. So my plan today is to challenge our thinking on misinformation. I wanna start with a question. What do you think the fake news problem is? So pause for a moment and think what you think that the answer to that is. What do you think the fake news problem is? Most often when I ask that question, I get the answer that it's misinformation at scale. And I'm gonna argue it is not truth or falsity per se, that's one of the key issues. And if we do that, that makes, defining it that way is gonna make the problem harder to solve, not easier. So I wanna see if we can chase this down a little bit. But it's also become a big issue across a number of different domains. So a lot of folks would like to form, for example, section 230. This is the law that protects platforms from the information their users project. Now the left wants to reform it because they want less misinformation, which implies taking more information off. And the right wants to reform Section 230 to reduce censorship, which means leaving more information up. How are we going to resolve that kind of issue as well? So I think we've got a number of issues that we need to address, and I think we're going to try to come up with different methods for doing that. So again, my hope is to challenge our thinking on social on uh, misinformation. And to give you tools to help fight injustice and perhaps ways of dealing with it. And barring that, maybe you'll press back on my ideas so you can inform me and I can go do a better job. So I'm hoping that we can come up with better solutions. This isn't a new issue. Um, I like this particular cover of The Economist because this came out in 2017 after the Russians had influenced the election in 2016 uh, and also after Cambridge Analytica. And what's interesting is that it's still we're still getting these kinds of issues only a couple of years later. We'll come back to that in just a bit. So that was 2017 relative to some of the other testimony later. Some wonderful work was done by some other colleagues uh, at MIT um, that looked at all the Twitter feeds and all of the misinformation there. I found that falsehood diffused significantly farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly than truth in all categories of information. What's fascinating and wonderful about that is we now have scientific proof of folk wisdom. What was the old folk wisdom? A lie can travel halfway around the world between truth can get its boots on. The beauty of this is it's not only folk wisdom because we've confirmed it, but it's also because it's also misinformation. It's not attributed to Mark Twain. Matter of fact, we don't know who said it. It's been attributed to half a dozen different people all the way back to Jonathan Swift in 1710. So it's a rumor that has been propagated and it's self-propagating in some interesting ways. Fake news isn't new. Some of the oldest versions of them are stone frescoes where kings are lying about their accomplishments. So men have been lying about their accomplishments as long as they've been accomplishments. So uh, it's an old problem. This particular quote, that a news editor has to contend not only with rumor, 
but with market rigor, the news faker, the promoter of questionable projects, and some of our best citizens obsessed with a single idea. 1925, this was the age of yellow journalism and William Randolph Hearst. There's lots of interesting things going on. So again, it's not new. If you do a Google um, Trends or Google Ngram, this is the plot of misinformation, disinformation, false information and fake news going back hundreds of years. And it's interesting, we've seen this for a long time. Misinformation about the king was sedition. Misinformation about God was blasphemy. Misinformation about citizens is slander. These spiked in World War II and in the Cold War because adversaries are apt to promote misinformation, to undermine and to disengage folks. And we see we get this huge spike in fake news only in the last three you know, to five years or six years. And, there's, and we can then track what's happened. But it's, again, it's not a new phenomenon. This is my summary of all the different solutions that I've seen to date, okay? This includes fact-checking with uh, crowds and algorithms, tagging and product labeling. Um, it's educating consumers. A particularly good one is accuracy nudges. So do you really want to share that? Because it's not actually true information. It's been shown to curb the, the willingness to reshare. Or banning the content. We've seen this uh, after the insurrection. Um, truth chasers, trying to put things in context or follow it with the actual information, or demoting it in the news feed. These are all the things I'm aware of. If there are others, please, by all means, let me know. I argue that these have one, if not more, of all of the following problems. The first is they simply put us into a technological arms race. If you're using technology to fight technology, one can recognize the filter, one can penetrate the filter. So we can do an arms race. The second is there's the problem of discrediting the raider. If someone's lying about the news, they're then very happy to lie about the person that rated that news. So there's another problem that just makes it recursive. A deeper one, which I think is often missed when you try to educate consumers is, I think it puts the liability or the responsibility on the wrong foot. That's on the recipient, not on the liar. And I think a lot of the interventions should be focusing on the liar and not on the recipient. And this last one, I've not seen a single intervention to address. At the moment, it is cheaper to produce fake news than it is to produce honest journalism. Just the economics fundamentally are different for the cost structure to make stuff up as opposed to actually do the real work. So no solution I'm seeing has anything to do with that last one, all right? But I well, it's why I think we've had such a hard time doing it. We're not gonna make progress if we can't define the problem carefully. So I wanna do two different things. The one is to ask how we've measured this previously and what do, well, how should we think about this problem? So in free speech, how would we know we've succeeded? Is there a first amendment equivalent to what we do have in antitrust? For example, we have the consumer welfare standard in antitrust. This, you know, uh, Bork actually had have that in First Amendment jurisprudence. Matter of fact, in the First Amendment jurisprudence, we tend to balance a couple of different properties. Uh, according to some of the most famous scholars in this, it includes seeking truth. You juxtapose ideas against one another. Whether it's Newtonian mechanics or flat earth or give and take just to get it. In other words, freedom of expression. You know, it offers exploration and affirmation of self, which changes culture, which then reaffirms self. So there's this kind of endogenous growth in culture. Another one is, and this is one of the most important across many different scholars. So you have stable social change. Given the diversity of different prospects, we've aligned not at utilitarian solutions, but at deontological solutions. Unlike 
torts. Unlike antitrust, U.S. courts expressly written by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court do not balance cost and benefits when we evaluate speech. Instead, we protect them according to different categories. The no or, or the less protected categories are such things as fraud, obscenity, illegal conduct, you know, intellectual property theft, incitement to imminent lawless action. This is deontological. The idea is if the rule is right, act on that rule absolutely regardless of consequence, okay? There's an even expression originally from, um, you know, from one of the popes, fiat justitia et periat mundi. Let justice be done though the world may perish. Purely deontological. We'll come back to that. Beauty of decision theory is if we're gonna look at the value of something, we have really good measures of value. We know if we've maximized it or not maximized it. So I'm gonna to try to hold up decisions theory and options as a metric that we can and perhaps should use in this contradistinction to what we have been using. Let me show you what we can do with that. All right, the first of these is the simple observation and the information value formula. Is good news or bad news value adding? If it's true, it's always value adding. Why? The value of information is defined as the best decision you can make when informed, net of the best decision you can make when uninformed. Even if it's bad news, that adds possible, that adds real value. So maybe you learn that CO2 is causing global warming, but now we can reduce emissions. Or maybe you learn we've got sickle cell anemia, and now we can take some stem cell treatments to deal with them. Now notice, it's not to say the information is always valuable. If it's false or if it's incomplete, then you get decision error and you get other kinds of harms. So for example, when Americans for Prosperity mails Democrats false voting deadlines, they're trying to cause a decision error. Or when the anti-vaxxers state that Colin Powell died of COVID despite being fully vaccinated, they conveniently neglect the fact that he also had blood cancer. Right? So they're trying to convince you that it doesn't work. So that's incomplete information. Yeah, Eric, you have a question. Uh, maybe this is a little bit semantic. No, no, the semantics, at the, the semantics at this point matter. So Eric is asking about the semantics. So um, you, true information you say is, is always valuable. Incomplete. True, true and complete information. Yeah, yeah, exactly. True and complete. Incomplete information can lead you astray. Exactly. So, so that's, that's a pretty important distinction there because I mean, in some sense, it is, all information is, is somewhat incomplete in the sense that there's many states of the world and some of them may be tangentially relevant. So, so how, do you, how do you nuance that? And, and, and my understanding, one of the big problems on, on social media pra platforms increasingly is not false information or lies, but cherry picking or nut picking that gives people a misleading impression of things, even if it's literally true. So, so maybe you could say a little bit more about that um, complete versus uh, uh, true issue. So th that is in some way a perfect setup to the next set of ob observations, which is in does incomplete information matter? And one of the most beautiful elements of that is it doesn't matter if the information is complete because it's false or it's information because it's true. The issue is going to be decision error. Let's illustrate with that with the very next point. Here, by the way, is false information that causes no decision error and therefore causes no problem at all. To give you an, an example of this. So we take this here. One, it's false information. Is Google is going from 266 to $300 a share. No, that's false information. That's actually gone to 2390 a share. That's actually false, but it's good. It's not affecting your decision in the wrong way. Similarly, Flaming hot Cheetos are being canceled. That was false. That was misinformation actually disseminated. Why? Because it drives engagement. Suppose you don't like flaming hot Cheetos. It doesn't matter because you're not buying them anyway. The issue is decision error. That is exactly the point, which is why I think that we don't want to focus on the truth or the falsity. We need to focus on the decision error. Let me illustrate that exact point even further. Here is much false information that just doesn't matter. Is Pluto a planet? Is it an asteroid? Is it a planet? Is it an asteroid? It's not gonna affect your life. It's not. Is the slogan, eat it, Jays, and live forever, true? 
That's provably false. The worst thing that happens is you eat there and you get a great meal. Further, fake news that's disbelieved is not a problem. To take Eric's example, let's flip it. Much true information does matter, but it's incomplete in this case. Almost every one of these instances that I've given you here is incomplete, or there's a second condition, which I'll come to in a moment. So Russia uses truth to suppress black votes in the United States, um, or there's misleading half-truths. Here's a beautiful example of a truth plus a truth equaling a lie. Any vaxxers point to a famous person that did receive the vaccine and did die two weeks later. They let you infer that they died because of the vaccine when in fact it had nothing to do with the cause. So it's two truths equaling a lie or true news that's disbelieved is not a problem or it could be a possible problem. You're not acting correctly. So it's not the completeness, it's the decision error. This is, now I want, this is another reason why this matters. Again, remember why I said, what's your definition of the problem? I said, focusing on veracity leads us down the wrong path. The first reason this is the case is you cannot own truth. You can't be liable for truth. You can't be dispossessed of truth. You wouldn't want a state that, state that tried to define it or dispossess you of truth. That would be a problem. That means it's a bad locus for law or operation of mechanism design. So here's my definition of our problem. To clear communications of information that causes decision error or negative externalities at scale, okay? Now here, for example, is loss of herd immunity, which includes these loss of externalities or Pizzagate where someone's shooting up a pizza parlor uh, based on misinformation or insurrection based on a lie. All of these are externalities. Why does this matter? All right, you can be liable for decisions and you can be liable for externalities. So the operation of mechanism design and the operation of law should be on those points, not on truth alone. So how we define the problem is gonna be one of the me mechanisms by which we can actually make progress. Here's the other reason why this is a problem, why this is, in my view, a better way to view the problem. Externalities cause market failures. Those imply need for intervention. Intervention is expressly forbidden by the First Amendment. That is why this is a hard problem, okay? We have a system designed to turn problems over to the marketplace of ideas for which we are rife with externalities, which are market failures, and a market cannot self-correct. That, I believe, is the nature of the problem. And that, I think, is what we need to see if we can solve. The rest of this talk weighs for trying to explore solutions for that. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's terrific. Actually, that, that last point is really interesting about that, that clearly some externalities. And one economist's common solution is government intervention. And the First Amendment is specifically about government not intervening. And, and there's there, but it does leave a little opportunity that there's interventions by entities that aren't the government. Hang on to that. Okay. Hang on to that. So you notice I listed up here as intervention the standard operations uh, from Pigou and from Coase. Those are the parties we know, of. they're the only solutions we know of. And so we've listed all of those and we'll see if we can operationalize exactly some of those techniques. And possibly relevant. Uh, Newsflash, or maybe it's a misinformation class, but multiple media reporting that Elon Musk's bid for Twitter has just been accepted. So- That's uh, gonna be interesting. So I, I would have some comments on that toward the end if folks are interested. I think that's, that'll be, be these slides. interesting. Okay. So here's the, um, this is what we're witnessing today. And again, this is an old phenomenon. Those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. This was 10 years before the American Revolution and 20 years before the, Fr the French Revolution. And we're seeing it again today as another set of issues. So I'm gonna go through three different sets of solutions. I think try to go toward the deeper issues. The first of these is solutions from choice architecture. See if we can shift the burden from different parties. Okay. So what's our problem with an externality? The information, the knowledge of harm is divorced from information and knowledge of the interaction itself. That's the definition of an externality. So how do we do that? We need to merge those two information sets. Now we can do that in one of two ways. One is to bring information off platform onto the platform. I argue that's a bad idea. 
One, it creates an immensely even more powerful platform. It doesn't align the incentives. They still don't necessarily have reason to fix it. They're not the ones experiencing the externality. And lastly, the variety of externalities is so large, they may miss some. By contrast, take the alternate solution, taking the information on platform and making that available off platform. Now we've decentralized possible intervention, which is not centralized, it's better. Um, it solves the secrecy problem. So things that aren't just hidden on platform can now be addressed off platform. And notice what this does is it allows third parties to intervene when they are affected. So my first solution, is to go beyond what these transparency laws do at present. At the moment they say, all right, Facebook has to report on who bought stuff, uh, what the content was and how much they paid. That's not enough. We need to enable counter speech. The mechanism is you'd have to keep sufficient detail that those parties affected by harm can actually intervene to address that harm. So this drives the decisions, again, that's the point of analysis of the third parties who are affected and also decisions of the recipients who received the negative information in the first place. You don't need to identify the recipients. You only need to provide equivalence of reach, equivalence of access to enable the counter speech. And the platform simply sells more ads in a context like this. So it's certainly business model compatible. Today, I'm gonna to try to go through three tiers of solutions. Those that are business model compatible, so firms should adopt them those that are not business model compatible that are legal, so they'll need pressure, and those that are bad law, that we need some reform. So this is the first set, okay? This first set, however, helps to undo the harm, but notice what it doesn't do. It doesn't change the incentives of the people causing harm. So it doesn't change the incentives of the liars. It only allows aid for undoing the damage that has been done. So what would we do in that case? The second is to reverse that slide that I showed you at the very beginning, we reverse amplification. So what's happening at present is that the platforms are amplifying liars because it gets engagement. We reverse amplification on liars. So if your reputation is sterling, you're completely allowed to do whatever you want. Go ahead, but any of the information that you want. But if we're caught, if you're caught lying, we're going to add friction to your social network and we're going to delay your messages. So here's a thought experiment for you. Suppose, hypothetically, you had 88 million followers. How many lies would you have to tell if we cut your follower network in half each time until you're only talking to yourself? 27 lies. Boom. How many times you'd have to repeat the election has been stolen until you're only talking to yourself in that kind of a condition? The beauty of this is actually very straightforward. One, ex post verification, vastly simpler the next anti-verification on 500 million messages. The most important piece of this, even ideologues that want to sway an audience are now motivated to use truth to do it because if they know they're lying, they're gonna cut their influence. So it goes directly to the mechanism that's motivating the lies in the first place. They want influence. So here by reverse amplifying liars and not just their lies, we solve the problem. But that's not business model compatible. So reverse amplification does change incentive on the liars, but it doesn't change the uh, platform business model. They don't want to do this. But here's where we got to get into the interesting definitions of the problem itself. So what were the other elements of it? It's decision errors and externalities. What the externalities are the damage you and I are suffering. And the platform's not internalizing that. For reference, this was a kind of fun piece. This is Mark Zuckerberg before Congress in 2018. He didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility. That's almost the definition of an externality because what the damage is happening off platform. They're not internalizing. Well, what's interesting is that not three years later, whistleblowers saying they're still not taking a broad enough view of their responsibility. Here is Francis Haugen arguing that Facebook is prioritizing profit over well-being. The result has been more division, more harm, more lies, more threats, and in some cases, dangerous online talk leading to actual violence that harms or even kills people. That's 2021. Another bit of testimony before Congress. So how do we address externalities? To solve an externality problem, we use, according to Pegu's ideas, 
a tax on a negative externality until a private marginal cost equals a social marginal cost. So you, they start to internalize the damage they're doing. Notice you can reverse this for subsidy for a good as opposed to a bad. So the externality is positive. That's why National Science Foundation subsidizes research. There are positive externalities. That's a good thing. And Pigot observes that even in his day, that's why a lot of societies would tax alcohol for the crime and damage that would occur on that. So in some sense, you're um, internalizing the harms. Now, one variant of this has been proposed by a Nobel Prize winner, Paul Romer. So he wants to put a Pigovian tax onto advertising. This has a couple of benefits. One, it might shift the business model from ads to subscriptions. Notice it cuts the incentives to do tracking. Uh, it might favor small, if you make it progressive, it might favor small firms relative to large firms. And this one's really neat. It avoids government intervention in speech. That's powerful. It's also a problem because avoiding content, tax, you tax engagement, not actually the harm. So you could have a subscription firm harboring hate speech, anti-vax disinformation, conspiracy theories, and false election materials and pay no tax versus a completely clean system paying a heavy tax. So you haven't actually addressed the issue of the harm itself. So here's what you would need to do is to place a probing tax on the externalities. So in this case, it would be on that channel. Now, I would propose you would start narrowly on foreign election interference, crime, terrorist recruiting, uh, sex trafficking, voter registration lies. The beauty of doing starting there is um, one, it internalizes the damage. So platforms would then start to feel that damage, but then also that avoids strict scrutiny according to free speech. None of those things are protected speech. Those are all in the categories of unprotected speech, not even low protection, but unprotected. So you can start in an area where there's no problem in that. But how do we solve the scale problem? 500 million messages a day. Usually it's lawsuits that are unpredictable, ex uh, expensive and slow. This is what section 230 is expressly designed to get around, right? So that we can have these platforms and there's some good things about them. Um, and so how do we solve that problem? Let's go back to our definitions. If this is a pollution problem, we tax the flow rate. We don't try to get every molecule from effluent. We try to actually sample it. So what do we do? You know, a doctor doesn't take, if they're checking your cholesterol, they don't take all your blood. They take a sample, right? So what we do is you want 90% accuracy, 99, 99.99999. Just take a bigger sample. The central limit theorem guarantees any level of accuracy you want just by taking a bigger sample. It doesn't matter if you get a few of them wrong. This allows us to deal even with half truths in it. Also means a progressive tax can handle startup versus big firms. If Facebook's looking at a 1% pollution rate, maybe a startup starts with a three or four or 5% pollution rate. So you can easily adjust that. And social dials can be for more for, uh, false positive, more false negative. So different societies can set these in different ways. So it's a really interesting, simple way to do that. Now, another element of this. These are quotes directly before the insurrection. So right on November 5th, after the election, an internal Facebook, and these are all from whistleblower documents. Not only do we not do something um, to handle electric information, we're actually composing the Stop the Steel groups. We amplify and give them broader distribution. Why are we doing this? Or the day after the insurrection, we've been fueling this fire for a long time. We shouldn't be surprised if it's now out of control. So how do we hold the platform accountable for its share of damage? What's its pollution tax, if you will? Here's the problem. One speaker provides the spark. The platform fans the fire, composes the group, pours on gasoline and amplifies it 1,000, 10,000 or 88 million times, right? How do we protect user speech? That's not censorship and deal with the liability for the increment to harm. So how do we solve that problem? So here's a way to think about this. We're Silicon Valley. A scientist creates an invention of unit value one, and a venture capitalist amplifies it a thousand times. The venture capitalist wants to claim value a thousand over a thousand plus one is his share. 
Now, the answer is no. Lloyd Shapley, another Nobel Prize winner, gave us the actual solution to that. What you do is you hold, you give each their share of the increment to their added value. So for the first increment, the scientist is completely indispensable and the venture capitalist irrelevant. So they get 100% of the first unit. Now for the next thousand units, both are indispensable. Without the invention, there's nothing to amplify, but if you don't have the amplification, you don't get the extra thousand units. So each gets half. So the scientist gets one plus 500 over one plus a thousand and the venture capitalist gets 500 over one plus a thousand. That's fair and Shapley proved it. So the interesting thing here is it doesn't matter if this is a good or a bad, we hold them accountable for their fair share. So it could be 500 over one plus a thousand or 5,000 5, over one plus 10,000 or 44 million over one plus 88 million. Now watch this. Suppose we charge the platform for its 500 over one plus a thousand of its share of a thousand units of damage. We still got to estimate the damage in here. But what's interesting about this, if you charge them for that and it's unprofitable, what does P do? They stop amplifying. Now, because damage is jointly created, all 1000 units disappear leaving only the spark, which is the free speech in this case, okay? So long as we charge the platform their own advertising price plus epsilon, it's not profitable to amplify. So we don't even have to go outside and estimate the size of the damage. We just have to target the lies that are causing the damage. By the central limit theorem, this is extremely predictable. So now what we've done is we've used Pigou together with central limit theorem on a flow rate to actually create an intervention. where We don't even have to measure all the full damage, but we can cause the damage to go away. And oh, by the way, suppose P wants to amplify because it's consistent with their editorial policy. Well, interestingly enough, they could still do so even though the full damage is a thousand, but now they're paying the price of their own ads to society. That's the cost of the free speech, if you will. Eric, you have a question. Yeah, so this is very interesting. Uh, but we do have a couple of questions um, that are several, a bunch of questions online here, but there's two of them that are, that are similar that I'll kind of bundle together. Uh, Ian Anderson asks, um, uh, we have people who even disagree on whether certain things are externalities. And your ghost Petropolis um, asks, how do I identify the negative externalities in the context of fake news in order to be able to tax them? He points out that Romer's tax is not contingent on making that identification, it just applies to all and everyone in that business model. So, I mean, a, a real nub of the problem, people disagree about whether the election was rigged or, or whatever else. So other than you, who should we turn to to arbitrate that or how do we decide that? Well, thank you as a setup for the next slide. <laughs> okay, so uh, I thank you for those questions. So the question is governance, who gets to decide and how? So here's some thinking on a way to think about that particular problem. What I'd like to do to that is to borrow an idea we've used in other contexts. So for effective government to solve some of the agency problems that are identified in that, who gets to decide and who make it legitimate, we separate the legislature from the judiciary from the executive. So my proposal is to make, for example, news organizations collectively the legislators. They would get to define what constitutes misinformation. Now, that's not a specific instance, it's only the definition. I would bet we might even be able to get Fox and CNN to agree on a definition, but they don't get to decide a specific instance. Juries or fact checkers could then serve as adjudicators and social media like Facebook would serve only as executors. Now notice <clears throat> um, this is uh, no one party actually makes the decision on what the definition is. No one party actually gets to uh, um, uh, uh, no one party, each party has to use the definition of someone else if they're deciding and the party that's actually executing on it then has to use someone else's adjudication. So you've gotten the bias out of the decision, you've taken the money out of the decision and you've taken the incentives out. Is this First Amendment compatible? Remember the problem with the externality is government can't intervene. I would envision doing something this as either self-governing trade association or standards body 
But if they refused to do this, then we could use a mechanism borrowed from political science, which is called metagovernance. I love this phrase because this is actually uh, a political science term that means governance above governance, but it also could mean regulating meta, which would be <laughs> what we need now anyway. Okay, so meta governance is government says you need to clean up your act or else we won't tell you how to do it. Now, an instance might be we'll tax all ads that's back to rumors, unless you do it specific unless you use some other mechanism which makes it even better. Okay, so that would be meta governance. Now notice what we've done. We've got a decentralized Pigovian mechanism where no one party decides, no money shades the decision, and no one has an incentive to bias a decision. That was the problem with the Pigovian mechanism because usually it's the government that assigns the tax. So I would use the proposal I just gave you together with meta governance to ensure that it actually happened. This brings us then to another market-based possible solution. Okay, because we've, we've overlooked the other half. Coase, can you create marketplaces to address the externality questions? And I'm hoping we're gonna have time to go into this because there's some all interpretation at the legal level. So look at political ads. What's interesting is that, polit that uh, Twitter has banned them entirely, whereas Facebook text takes them and doesn't do fact checking at all. Their argument is let the users decide. This is complete nonsense where he's pushing all the work onto users in a way that's good for him, right? It's his business model compatible and it's not necessarily good for others. He should be uh, more liable for this. Let's go into the economics of why this is the case, okay? Uh, notice by the way, the first option prevents newcomers from gaining a voice. So incumbents, if there's no political advertising, incumbents have an advantage relative to uh, entrants. And the other one pollutes our political discourse. That's the, collusion, the pollution, or if you will, what Obama just said, right? Flooding the field with sewage. That's literal pollution and we need to clean it up, okay? So I wanna give you some intuitions from classic economics, information signaling and screening. So a couple months ago, I was buying a bike lock for my son. And I wanna ask the question, which of these claims is more credible? I'm gonna protect your bike. And there are three separate claims. Claim number one is this is this like will do it. It's 23 bucks, there's no warranty. The second one is 35 bucks and there's a three year warranty. The third one is it's 80 bucks and $2,500 to you if your bike is stolen. Now, which of these do you think is gonna keep your bike from being stolen? The first one ain't gonna make that claim because they ain't gonna be able to honor it. You just go in with a pair of clippers and you got the bike and they're gonna be out of money. The parties with the private information can signal by offering credible guarantees. So the way we handle this is an honest advertising marketplace. You allow, this is a new institution, you allow claimants the option to guarantee that their claims are true. The guarantee is a resource plain, uh, placed at risk, forfeit if the claim is false and returned if true. We'd use the same adjudication mechanisms that we just proposed, okay? What does this do? First, it shifts liability to the author, not the platform, not the recipient, right? No one knows better the, uh, the truth of a claim than the party that wrote that claim, all right? So honest, notice it's also honest ads are free to the truth teller and they're expensive to the liar in the same way that $2,000 guarantee is expensive to the bike lock that won't protect you, okay? Politicians can still lie if they wish, it just gets expensive or beautifully, by the way, in a market-based mechanism like this, you could be a whistleblower in a totalitarian government and put this out there and even if they, um, disagreed with you, you could get your truth out. It just is expensive. Notice that as an option, honest authors could be motivated to signal their claims are true because they're free in effect. This changes the cost structure. Now it's cheaper to produce truth than lies because you're not on the hook for the truth. You're on the hook for a lie and it's self option. And notice this is total market decentralization. I don't have to involve government at all. So I've used a Cosian solution together with the information signaling and screening solution to try to design an honest advertising market. Okay. This goes to interesting differences in liability. So if we now take a step back and look, where is media law today? 
I would argue that it is basically determined by the technology of the time. Print from the 1914 law that established federal trade communication is liable for all ads. We'll come back to this in a minute, little bit later with New York Times v. Sullivan. Um, so uh, you have total editorial discretion and you have total liability in print. Broadcast came up with the FCC Act in 1934. This is also a time when broadcast consumed a scarce resource. To deal with that, media still had to maintain liability except in the case of political candidates, in which case then they had to take it, but then they didn't have the liability. So this was a way that the candidates could gain a voice if the resource were scarce. And then of course, today we have internet, which is platforms ain't liable for anything and they got total discretion. So they're at far extreme. Notice that a lot of the proposals today are to make these fair across all different media by going with the middle standard. So the, the proposals are to put all of them on the broadcast standard as opposed to the print or the internet standard. Okay, yes, all right. Um, two, first, Steve Titus has a number of good points. I'll try and capture them and save them for you later, but, but um, I'll pass on one question he has in particular, which is that even at small scale, fake news creates externalities. You know, if you talk to a few friends, you could be an externality. You're talking about platforms. Where does this all kick in? Does it happen if, if I have a WhatsApp group? So, you know, so um, remember my definition of the problem is clear communications channels that cause a decision error or externalities at scale, right? So I expressly say, you know, if you are fibbing to a spouse or you've lied on your taxes, that's just not at scale. And you wouldn't want any intervention mechanism examining every single communication. Where a society wants to set that dial would be a little different. So I might set it at an order of magnitude. So if it's an, you know, if an, an order of magnitude better value than the cost provided, maybe that's a boundary, but different societies could set that externality at, so I say at scale, but where you want to set that scale will be a, a criteria. Millions? Is that so I'm clearly, I would put millions in that category as the point of intervention, but it's a society, everything I'm trying to do is to give, societies dials that they can tune. Mm -hmm. So some societies, whether it's an Asian society, Western society, Islamic Sharia society, could tune these dials there are, there based on different levels. Where, as I understand it, WhatsApp and, and groups are, you know, cells are, are passing on and maybe it gets, mutates a little bit, it goes from one- That's an extremely other. subtle issue that would take me about, I've, I've got a solution for that, but it takes about five, 10 minutes to give the details of that. And you can even, if you do this correctly, you can even deal with private chat rooms, but that's going to take us off topic. Okay. So time there after, or I can talk to you later. But yeah, we have about 15 minutes up. There are also some broader questions here that I'm holding. So, so, so uh, yeah, so let's, that's, let's that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a level of subtlety with big policy implications. Like we have an answer to that, but let's see if we can take that one offline. Um, the issue here on media liability, by the way, notice that if we use the existing solution of broadcast, then Tom Steyer, who's on the left, cannot get, take out ads on Fox News and has been turned away. And Pillow Guy, who's on the right, can't take out ads on CNBC because they don't like him. So you can't get a voice under that proposal. So we use information economics and we use Coase and Calabresi and Melamed. And we show, go after socially optimal liability. Watch. So if the advertiser or publisher, I think they should be liable not the users as uh, Mark Zuckerberg would have the, us believe. Why? First of all, the advertiser authored the ad so they know. And clearly it's socially efficient to check it once while receiving payment. That is the low cost of lawyer, as opposed to checking it 10,000 times when you haven't received payment. That is the high cost avoider, okay? So here's the proposal. We maintain the platform or the publisher liability for all ads they accept. Further, under their editorial policy, they can reject any ad they don't, they don't like, so they can do that. But if an advertiser will warrant their claims are true, then the platform must take the ad, but liability shifts to the advertiser. What does this do? It's completely fair across all media, and I don't care what the technology is. If we invent telepathy, it still works. Second, it's socially efficient in terms of the cost structure, right? The party that has the editorial policy has the liability, and that's what should happen. 
So the platform can maintain their editorial policy and hold that liability. And notice the advertiser can reach any audience they wish at the cost of assuming the liability. And what does this do? It increases the truth of the ads and it reduces polarization. Tom Steyer can buy an ad on Fox and Pillow Guy can buy an ad on, CN on CNBC if he wants. So it's a way of adjusting the socially optimal liability and it should fix and clean up some of the media law as well. The last set of ideas, we've been going through business model ideas, and I want to get to the, the federal and judicial issues. There's an even deeper set of layers we want to get to, too. Just a clarification on the last point. So, so is there like a special category called publisher platform that has certain duties that are different from other people? They have to. So, so, this is, so these, are the, these are the categories. So print, broadcast, and internet. And, and, so, the, so the liability differs by each category right. currently. And it's a tech, in my view, it's a technology view, and it's not economically driven. Right now, uh, publisher has discretion over what they have in their publication. That's correct. But one of your- well, hold on, Be, be was, careful. A, these things between a print publisher and a broadcast publisher. Print has full discretion. Broadcast has discretion except for political candidate mm -hmm. ads. And the internet has full discretion. But in, in your proposal, as I understand it, they would be required to take an ad if somebody warrants it's truthful, even if correct. they don't want to publish that. That is correct. And so what you do is you shift the liability to the party with the editorial policy. The one writing the ad has the editorial on that and they have the right. liability. But there's also the content. Maybe they want to have an ad about voting and somebody, they would and be required to have content. They're not required. Not, it's, again. Must accept. So, no, the platform must accept. Yeah. So, um, so you're going to have to, put, you're going to have to pay at favorable rates. That's a matching marketplace. You're not going to advertise uh, voting markets to you know folks that normally are interested in um, I don't know buying laptops. You, you have you have a different question there. So you're trying to, the matching market should help solve those kinds of issues. Okay, but you're saying they wouldn't have the right to make that decision anymore if the other party is willing to assume the liability. Okay. The last one is the we're still faced with deontological solutions to these issues, and these this is. We don't have, we haven't been using utilitarian solutions. We've been using categorical and truth-based solutions. I want to give you a couple of interesting examples. Last year, there was a cert, sorry, last year there was a suit by Washington, Washlight versus Fox News. This is the Washington League for Information Transparency and Ethics. They sued Fox News for propagating false information on health effects of precautions, for claiming COVID-19 was a hoax and violating deceptive practices of the Consumer Protection Act. Um, what's interesting is that the lower court threw it out, citing U.S. v. Alvarez, that certain facts, false facts, are not necessarily an unprotected category. And um, even if the Consumer Protection Act were implicated, it's trumped by First Amendment anyway. The appeals court affirmed the lower court and again threw it out, adding, no matter how outrageous the claim, it's still protected. This goes back to that deontology. And so, by the way, the goal is really laudable, but guess what? We have to protect it anyway. So we're back to deontology. Let justice be done, though the world may perish. What I want to propose is decision option criterion. So the original test was to look for the false facts or not um, and establishing deceptive trade practice. What I want to do is I want to actually ask, is it affecting decisions? And this is actually an extension of Stuart Mill's ideas do anything you want. You're entirely do at liberty up to the point of what? The harm principle. It causes harm to other parties. So imagine if we focus on decision, not truth. The issue is input any expression you want out there up to the point where the decisions cause sufficient harm. And do you cause that to happen? Is it causal? This will bring us back to data science, all right? So let's take a look at the data science. Viewing Hannity increased COVID-19 mortality. They had COVID controls for that with other cable news networks. Viewing Fox News reduced social distance compliance. They had mobile phone data to look for that kind of control. Viewing Fox News was a so reduced mask and sanitizer consumption. They had UPC data. Viewing Fox News lowered vaccination rates for COVID. Notice it had no effect on vaccination rates for standard flu shots. And interestingly, Fox News had even run stories chastising people that didn't take the polio vaccine. 
They also had a completely hypocritical policy opposing government vaccination for uh, mandating testing for employees when they had a mandate and testing for their own employees. The natural response to this, of course, is what about personal agency? There are any number of different information sources out there. Could we really hold Fox News responsible to that? I have three responses to that. The first is basic ethics. If we're using a deontological standard, then let's use a deontological standard. Deontologists require truth telling and they reserve a special scorn for hypocrites. Why? You cannot be practicing a universal law if you're applying one rule to yourself and the opposite rule to other parties. That's hypocrisy. So that by its own criteria is wrong. Second, we've got data science on this on our side. We've now got the tools. This is the kind of stuff that should be happening here at CEPR and Data Science Institute and other. So they're controlling for the data science using Tucker as a control for Hannity, other cable news networks, location treatments, UPC data, uh, mobile phone data. We have certainty and precision well past a reasonable doubt, which is the standard in the courts for tort. And notice, by the way, pharma already uses a market share liability property. So if a drug causes real harm and the drug is gone, you don't know which one a specific person took, but you can hold drug companies accountable based on their market share for that damaging drug. So we're already doing it in another context. And lastly, let's go back to Coase and Calabresi and Melamed. Damage is a function of both parties' decisions. A negative good, if you're gonna assign property rights, does restore efficiency, but the transaction's costs are high and you must assign the liability to the low cost avoider else you get serious moral hazard, which is exactly what we're witnessing, propagation of massive amounts of uh, falsehood. Um, so that the party, you have to, decide to the, assign it to the party producing the misinformation. The alternate, all viewers checking all claims is an absurdity of inefficiency. So that's the socially efficient outcome that we should have. A, this goes to either to deeper branches of law. Here's the irony, the strongest arguments, though there's a Brandenburg decision, Brandenburg, Ohio, that contracted government's ability to intervene even more. It's one of the strictest changes in free speech intervention of any case in US history. But even the staunchest supporters, if most free speech absolutists carve out the exception for falsely shouting fire to cause a panic in a theater. What's interesting here is the news organization is falsely shouting not fire when there is one and then the courts are defending them after people get burned. So we already have, and it's consistent with existing free speech jurisprudence. But I want to take it a step further. I argue we should be doing now what we did 50 years ago, 40 years ago. The antitrust paradox was that legal interventions under consumer welfare standard, or pre-consumer welfare standard, were to protect consumers and free trade markets. They artificially raised prices and protected bad products. They protected competitors rather than protecting competition. The law changed in the 1980s, thanks to Bork's interventions in there. We have the exact same thing here. The First Amendment paradox is that legal intervention intended to protect free speech markets and the community are having the opposite effect. In effect, what's happening is you're protecting folks from acting on the consequences of those ideas. You're not holding it to Mill's harm principle. They are causing harm and you're, you're protecting them from the torts that they should be liable for. So can we update free speech in exactly the same manner that we updated antitrust law and we already did it once. So that's one way to do that. Uh, I think we're running out of time. Uh, I had an analysis applying this even to New York Times v. Sullivan as another instance of this same thing. The one thing I will, um, I the one thing I will mention is that if we use decisions as opposed to truth, we even get the benefits of that particular decision. The reason we wanted this absence of malice standard was to give press breathing room in the context of extra falsity. When I went, if you go back to my claim earlier that um, false information, uh, true information don't matter if they don't give the wrong decision. We have breathing room in that case. So we even get the benefits of solving that problem uh, in an older case when we've got all kinds of problems that are arising from that particular standard. So we can address using 
these tools, we should even be able to address from the consequences of New York Times v. Sullivan in modern speech. So the upshot of this, well, I'll just- um, oh, Yeah, we only have like four minutes. I do want to give a chance to people in the room and, and online to a bunch of questions, so. Um, so this was it. Uh, I'll just give you the, the, la the summary. Disinformation is a form of pollution. It's a hard problem because we focused on truth or intent or categories and not decisions. It's also a problem because we lack or we forbid institutions for addressing externalities. Using government risks totalitarianism, but section 230 has the opposite problem. It, institutions are individualistic and they give the same kinds of problems. You've simply turned it over to private enterprise. If we use the right tools, we can develop with some solutions that are business model compatible. And externality solutions based on Pigou and Coast can be decentralized. Markets can clear themselves of falsehoods preserving even press breathing room if we focus on decision change, not truth or falsity. We properly assign liability rules in this regime and stop intervening in markets to protect bad participants. And that is what we've been doing. If you go back to the original flaws we had in the original uh, problems, I don't know if you can read them, but these were arms race, discrediting the raider, responsibility on the wrong foot and cost structure. We have a mechanism, we're out of the arms race. It's hard to discredit a peer jury. We now have responsibility on the liar and not the recipient. And we've changed the cost structure of the honest ads markets. So it's cheaper to produce truth than lies. So that I believe is one of the sets of ways to go after this set of problems. Thank you so much, Marshall. Uh, I think we, uh, first I'll give a chance to anyone in the room who has a question wants to ask. Uh, okay, so let me, um, let me actually let me just follow up on, on uh, one clarification or, or point. So you, you described how you know juries and, and peers could could help educate this better. Help me understand better why that didn't happen. The example you just gave a few slides ago of the Fox News case was it that there was an excess reliance on deontological absolutist, or was it that was it something else? Um, so it, in the Washlight v. Fox News case, it was strictly relying on uh, existing free speech jurisprudence. In particular, uh, one is the categorical analysis and also a particular case, Alvarez, um, you know, US v. Alvarez. This was the fellow who lied about having a um, Congressional Medal of Honor, but interestingly enough, it had no consequence. He'd simply introduced himself in a meeting. And so that falsity, because it had no consequence, it wasn't obscenity, it wasn't uh, committing fraud. It wasn't, you know, uh, incitement to violence. It didn't fit existing categories. And so they declined to add another category, misinformation about military honors. So in this case, it, they hinged on two things. One, well, it's falsity, but if you move it as falsity in policy relevant, policy relevant is a protected category of free speech. And therefore, it can't even advance. So, so it's false. It doesn't matter, and it's protected. Is that something you would change? I would change. I would hold them. So I would still, um, uh, I would still allow the exact same protected categories, but I would allow the the case to proceed based on the statistical evidence we have of the numerous deaths, and we can assess damages based on in the same way that pharma. Has been responsible for the deaths from oxycontin so to, to sharpen my understanding a little bit one of the things correct me if i'm wrong you're calling for is um considering more of the harms and the Peruvian approach um and not having an absolutist approach to uh, it would be is, is it would be allowing or? torts to proceed that have been forbidden on the basis of free speech it's almost exactly analogous by allowing bad products to die because they expose to competition. You're, you're holding folks accountable for the decisions they influence in others. That's so, you know, they can say whatever they want. It's exactly consistent with Mills, be as expressive as you want up to the point of causing harm. And once we've got the statistical tools to prove it, then we hold them accountable. Great, okay. So let me go to some of the questions here. I mean, the very first question that was asked uh, before I mentioned uh, the Twitter uh, purchase, was by Kai Nugan, who says, what do you think about a billionaire trying to buy a social media platform? Is it going in against anything you were trying to tell us today? So it uh, seems uh, relevant. So uh, I, I think it's an interesting case. So first off, I 
love Elon Musk for his cars and uh, other programs and his technology and his ability to do companies. I am genuinely concerned about private individuals determining um, speech for everyone else for the same reason. I don't think it should be centralized with anybody, whether that's government, private individuals, uh, private enterprise. I think that's a bad thing, period. Musk claims he's trying to balance a couple of things. He says he wants to create trust and friendly environments, but he also says that he wants to protect free speech. We've already been through this. I'm not sure he's going to be able to do better than the others. Twitter already expressed itself as the free speech wing of the free speech party, and it's evolved its moderation practices over time. Uh, Parler claimed it was going to do the same thing, and then people on uh, Parler um, then um, trolled uh, some of the original uh, Trump supporters using free speech, using hate speech, and using pornography. All of those are protected by the First Amendment, and Parler had to back off. So it seems as though he's going to be reinventing the tire, and he should stick to putting those on Teslas and not on Twitter. All right. Well, there's so many more questions I have, and I think other people have, but unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you very much, Marshall. That was a fascinating. Really appreciate you sharing it all with us. I think, look, in all seriousness, please do get in touch. I think this is one of the problems of our time, and any way thing you can do to help improve these ideas, I would love to hear from you. So thank you for the opportunity. So uh, thanks very much, Marshall. And in a week, we, we, May next 9th. week is off, right? May 9th, we have Anastasia. Anastasia yeah, why don't you go ahead Fettig. and tell us? Yes, Anastasia Fedek. We will have our next seminar in this room. So I hope all of you can join us, and I hope you can join us online as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Oh, good. Oh, there's so many great.